This is part of a new series that we're launching called Transformations and Foundations of things that the Bush Center can talk about that are gonna be part of our lives in the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years that we may not appreciate today. So uh, today in this Transformations uh, discussion, uh, we're gonna talk about artificial intelligence and the developments of AI. And uh, Scott Phoenix is with us and Scott is a, uh, a serial entrepreneur who is working in the AI space. Uh, he has backing from uh, some of the household names in Silicon Valley, uh, and his company is called Vicarious, uh, and it is working on automation with robots, and he is one of the leading entrepreneurs uh, in artificial intelligence, and so we're very excited that uh, Scott has joined us for this discussion about transformations. Thanks. Let me just turn this up so I can see what my next slide is here. Great. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, AI, um, and uh, just before I begin, I want to do a quick poll of the audience here. Can you raise your hands if you've heard of artificial intelligence before? Okay, virtually everyone. Now keep your hands up if you can give a cogent explanation of what it is and how it works. <laughs> okay, nobody. Great. So uh, that's the first thing we're talking about. What is AI? How does it work? Uh, so hopefully we'll have some context to talk about what are the economic, social, and policy implications. And finally, to talk about you know, what are the shortfalls of it and, and what's coming around the corner. Um, so uh, as, uh, as Ken said, we're we're a, a Silicon Valley startup. We're backed by some of uh, my personal heroes, people like uh, Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos. Um, we've been working on it for about eight years and are about to ship our first product. Um, so uh, if you tune into popular media and you ask, you know, what is artificial intelligence? What should I think about it? You, you in, in, inevitably see clips from people like one of my investors um, telling you exactly how you should feel about it. We should be very careful about artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> And so naturally, I think people feel a little nervous about this technology. And <laughs> <coughs> I, I think the first thing that we should all kind of sync up about is that AI is not magic. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's really actually kind of basic pattern matching. Uh, and to help explain that, like, why don't we just build a little AI system together in the next couple of slides? Um, and uh, this is going to be extremely simplified. So this is not the way a real AI system works at Google. But actually, it's close enough that it may as well be. So you, you'll actually will have a pretty good understanding of what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, and so we're going to make an AI for reading handwritten digits uh, between 0 and 9. Um, and the first thing we want to do if you're going to build an AI system to do anything at all is you need to collect a really big hand-labeled data set uh, of training data for your AI. So this is um, 6,000 examples of the number 0. And then this is another 6,000 of the number 1 and the number 2 and so on. And we get 60,000 hand-labeled examples of different digits. And we give it to our AI system. And then when it sees a new image, like this 4 here, and it doesn't know what it is, uh, it can then compare that image to everything it's seen in its training database saying, OK, does it look like this image? Does it look like this image? And we go on and on and on. And then it gets to 4 and it says, oh, wait. It looks kind of like this one, and 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 so on. And now it can come pretty confidently to the conclusion that this is a 4. And now, together, we've built our first AI system. Give yourselves a round of applause. Well done. <laughs> um, now, uh, quick quiz. Does anyone feel nervous that this system is going to take over the world and put us in grave danger? Uh, one person. Oh, no. Uh. You're supposed to say no. Uh, <laughs> so it's just doing pattern matching. It's, it's not sentient. It doesn't have any opinions about anything at all. All it does is take a, a new pattern and match it to some old ones. Uh, and that largely is actually the way AI works today. Uh, and so if we want to take this a step further and make this work, on photos instead, like let's say we wanted to, to classify this picture as containing corn, uh, we take one training example with a label corn, and then uh, instead of 60,000 examples, we show it 1.1 uh, million photos where every one of those dots is a, is a training example that's been hand labeled by a human. Uh, and then we'll have a system that where we can show it a picture like this one, and it'll say, okay, it's a car. But uh, it may say this photo is a bedroom pillow because it didn't have anything like this in its training data set. Um, and while it may classify this as a jaguar, it will have no idea what the drawing of the same images is. And it will also think these things are jaguars too. Um, and that's just because that's the way these systems work. Um, so I actually think there's you know, a, a great lens for understanding what's happening in the, the evolution of artificial intelligence is actually how animal intelligence evolved. So if we go back 600 million years, we get the first intelligent animals, things like jellyfish and flatworms and sea sponges. And as time passes, um, the animals get more complicated, and I would argue they don't get any smarter. It's just deeper nesting of these pattern matching kinds of behaviors. Uh, in the neuroscience world, we call this the old brain. It's based on instinct, based on stimulus and response. 
Um, and then about 100 million years ago, evolution uh, discovered a radically different architecture for intelligence. Uh, the, in the neuroscience world, we call the new brain, and it's about causal reasoning. It's about what if, it's about why. Okay, so that's what AI is. Let's talk about some of the implications. Um, I'm not an economist or policy expert, uh, and uh, you know, a lot of the opinions I'm going to be giving to you here are summaries of ideas I've heard elsewhere. Uh, and so uh, if you want a more informed perspective than mine on this, then there are lots of great books to read about it, but I'll do my best to give you sort of an overview. So there's three broad classes of implications. First, talk about economic, social, and policy. Uh, we'll start with economic implications. Um, the first one is, I, I think the, the best way to look at AI today is a decrease in the price of prediction. Because if you, if you do it that way, then you can use all your standard economic tools to evaluate what's the consequence of a decrease in the price of prediction. Namely, use goes up and the value of the complements goes up. Uh, and this is a, you know, from a book called Prediction Machines that is either out now or will be out soon. Um, and so use increases, so we start using AI everywhere. Like for example, there's an AI to predict whether or not an email is spam or what ad to show you or what I'm saying when I speak to Siri or Alexa or who's in my photos, uh, cars and obstacles in a self-driving car. Um, predict who I'm likely to vote for, predict what information to show me to change who I'm likely to vote for. <coughs> uh, and then uh, the value of compliments also goes up. So the value of data, the value of compute. If this is uh, the stock price of NVIDIA, which makes uh, chips that people use to train AI algorithms over the last four years, would have been good to buy four years ago. Um, and um, also any company that has a large data asset like Google or Amazon or Facebook is gonna get stronger by virtue of this trend. There's also some implications for jobs. If you ask the internet what's going to happen to the jobs because of AI, they're going to give you, these are the headlines from like the past week or something uh, on, on, uh, on, on the internet. And what they all say is basically that we're all screwed, the jobs are gone, uh, and AI is going to ruin the economy. And um, I think, uh, you know, you might have read a quote like this one, we are being afflicted with a new disease of which some readers may not yet have heard the name, but of which they will hear a great deal in the years to come, namely technological unemployment. This means unemployment due to our discovery of means of economizing the use of labor, outrunning the pace at which we can find new uses for labor. When do you think this article was written? Anyone? 1930. Just about right. Uh, so this is not a new problem. Um, and I'd like to just explore a counter-narrative with you. Um, namely, that if we zoom out, we look at the last 3,000 years of human history, uh, it's a story of us inventing mechanical contraptions to take a job that used to take five people one day and turn it into a job that takes one person a couple of hours. So the printing press, the wheel, the car, all of these things are contraptions that make uh, us be able to do more work with less. And the result of 3,000 years of doing that over and over again is that there are more people, more jobs, and a higher standard of living for everyone. And so to think that this time is different, this particular contraption is different, uh, I think has a pretty high burden of proof. Um, the best uh, uh, corresponding event in history that I can find that relates to a new technology like AI is, is what happened in the 1900s around agriculture. So um, we went from 40% of the US working age population working on a farm to 2% uh, as a result of, of farming automation. And you know, what happened in our economy was not that we had 38% unemployment, but in every decade virtually since 1890, the labor participation rate has gone up instead of down. Uh, and so that gives me some hope that perhaps the same will be true of, of AI. Um, another story that gives me some hope is ATM machines. People, uh, when they were first introduced, it was predicted that this would be the end of the bank teller. And there are twice as many bank tellers today as there were in 1980 uh, because ATMs just automated the unprofitable part of being a bank, <laughs> deposits, withdrawals. And now tellers focus on credit cards, home loans, mortgages. And so there are more bank branches than ever before. Um, and another you know, beacon of hope here is there are actually 7 million unfilled jobs in America right now. And you know, as an example, there's 300,000 unfilled welder roles. These are jobs that are not easy to automate. <clears throat> and um, I think that perhaps freeing up some of the workforce to be able to attack these jobs instead of more uh, mundane things that machines can help us with will result in a more efficient economy. Uh, and then the last piece I would say is that lots of new jobs are being created by technologies. If you look at the demand for taxis um, in you know, 2015, and then what happens when ride-sharing apps like Uber are introduced? It's not that people stop using taxis and one's a substitute for another. In, in fact, people just start consuming way more than they ever did of uh, ride services. And so um, now we have an entire class of, of, uh, of employment that is people who work in ride-sharing uh, for ride-sharing apps. OK, so those are some economic implications. Let's talk about the social ones. Um, <coughs> so 
a great thing about AI is that it, it, it can predict what I might want to read and show me things that I'm interested in, which sounds on the surface to be really nice, because I don't want to read boring articles. I'd like to read interesting ones. But the dark side of this is called a filter bubble, which is, as it turns out, people really love reading articles that confirm their worst prejudices. And um, they don't like articles that challenge their worst prejudices or challenge their self-identity. And so what has happened now is that there's lots of people who are only exposed to information that confirms their worst impressions of society uh, on both sides of the aisle. I would encourage you to go to this website on the Wall Street Journal called Red Feed, Blue Feed. And it, it basically takes the most polarizing, biased uh, journalism and sites on both sides of the political spectrum, puts them side by side. So you can see how both sides make a false narrative about the topic they're trying to sway the reader to, to believe in. And it's, I think it's really sad. Um, <clears throat> this is a, probably a familiar picture. Another consequence, social consequence of, of AI um, being able to, to predict what people might respond to is now we can have uh, sort of cultural smart bombs by foreign agents. Uh, you can identify what kind of information is likely to sway someone's actions and what kind of information might someone be susceptible to and then tailor, make uh, specific headlines, specific articles, specific media to address that audience and get them to do something different than they would otherwise do. Let's talk about some policy implications. So um, the biggest one in my mind here is about autonomous weapons. Uh, autonomous weapons are uh, one of the world's worst ideas. Um, this is a, a, a consumer drone you can buy today for $2,500. And um, the problem with autonomous weapons is that if you have a bunch of autonomous drones that fly around with explosives on them, they are loyal to you <coughs> until someone finds a bug. And if we know anything about software, is it's impossible to write software that doesn't have any bugs in it. So your army becomes someone else's army if they just find one exploit. And let me show you what this drone can do. So this is a drone. You, you tell it who to follow or who to target. And then it relentlessly follows them, uh, even if they're trying to avoid it in things like densely cluttered trees. Imagine this drone with a, an improvised explosive device attached to the bottom of it. And you kind of get the picture. Now imagine you know, 10,000 or 50,000 of these released in a city. And it gets a lot worse. So uh, this is an area of policy that I really strongly believe in. And I think governments should be taking action to make sure that autonomous weapons are not built. Uh, another area, <clears throat> policy, we are not investing enough in fundamental research. Uh, and I, when I see news about the kinds of commitments other countries are making to fundamental research, especially in AI robotics, it makes me very concerned about where the United States will end up in the future. Um, another policy issue that I'm super concerned about is, is immigration. Um, these are six faces you probably recognize, uh, Elon Musk from Tesla and SpaceX, uh, Sergey uh, Sergei Brin from Google, Jeff Bezos, Jerry Yang from Yahoo, Pierre Midiar from eBay, and Steve Jobs. All six of these people are immigrants or children of immigrants. And <clears throat> we wouldn't have them without the former United States' policy on immigration. And uh, you know, I can tell you right now for Vicarious, we hire people mostly from not the United States. And it's not because um, we want to, it's because there's just such a talent shortage for high technology skills like building artificial intelligence and robots. And in just the last two years, it's gotten so much more difficult for us to get visas for these people. And uh, I think that we, by not attracting and retaining the best and the brightest people in the world in America, are going to be, find ourselves in a very challenging position in the next 10 years.